I am Dr. Rick Kirshner. I am an Oregon licensed naturopathic physician and a senior vitalist with the Naturopathic Medicine Institute. I'm a best-selling author on conflict resolution and a filmmaker on medical history. And I'll be your host for what I'm certain will be an extraordinary evening with some fascinating speakers, followed by questions and a discussion. I can tell you right at the top of our evening that nobody on our panel is anti-vaccine. We're not here to tell you what to think or what to do. We're basing these vaccine education seminars on something Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said, and we believe is true. He said, Americans can handle an open discussion about vaccines. And our business this evening is pressing. Once upon a time, most parents obediently brought their children to the doctor when shots were due. The compliance rate was very high. Parents who objected for one reason or another just got an exemption from school attendance mandates and they kept quiet about it. Every state had a medical exemption, most had a religious exemption, and many had easily obtained philosophical or personal belief exemptions. Kids sat side by side in schools with no concern about each other's vaccination status. And it was common knowledge among parents about how to deal with normal childhood infections and fevers. Vaccines are a marketing dream come true for the drug industry. Fear drives demand and they practically sell themselves. But as the number of scheduled vaccines has grown from three in my childhood to seven in the 1980s, and now 16 vaccines requiring at least 70 doses, the number of chronically ill kids has reached epidemic proportions, and more parents have naturally become interested in understanding the risks versus the benefits of these medical products. But as more parents began questioning the schedule or specific vaccines, the states started repealing exemptions and trying to throw healthy kids out of school if their parents didn't submit. The problem with coercion is that it undermines trust. The result is that in state after state, parents whose concerns were ignored started organizing to defend themselves from the coercion descending on state capitals in ever great num greater numbers to voice their concerns and objections, and many of them had severely injured children in tow. For example, in New York this summer, thousands of angry parents rallied outside the Albany State House in opposition to a hastily passed law that ended religious exemptions. In Oregon, House Bill 3063 generated huge crowds of parents rallying against an attempt to throw 36,000 kids out of school for the crime of missing even a single dose of 11 scheduled vaccines. In California, despite the fact that an unprecedented number of outraged parents surrounded the Capitol to make their objections known, the California legislature ridiculed and then ignored them and passed new laws further limiting medical exemptions. And that's the only kind of exemptions available in California because California removed conscience exemptions with previous bills. California's bills signed by their governor have successfully and completely undermined the ability and willingness of medical doctors in California to write vaccine exemptions based on actual medical history of their young patients. 882 out of 882 California pediatric practices were contacted and they said that they would not write any medical exemptions even for a child who had gone into anaphylactic shock following a previous vaccination. Anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction that kills rapidly by shutting off the airway. It's one of the few allowable indications for a medical exemption in California now and not a single pediatric practice will write such an exemption. Promises made on previous bills were broken, and it's now all or none in California, and if you don't cooperate, your child is excluded from a public education, and if you're poor, you lose benefits provided by the state. The incremental approach to tightening vaccine laws in California has shown us the real agenda of lawmakers in multiple states who are introducing bills to deny the right to make informed choices about risky, liability-free medical products 
based on conscience or medical history. Many Oregon families are rightly concerned that what happened in California will embolden the same forces in Oregon. We've been told that medical industry insiders elected to our legislature are planning to bring another mandate bill in the coming short session aimed squarely at infringing the right of families to make medical decisions for their kids. We've been told that they need some kind of win to save face after their failure to pass it the last time. And if our governor, Kate Brown, has her way, she'll change the rules in the legislature so instead of them needing two-thirds of the members to form a quorum, only half will need to be present, effectively allowing the Democrat supermajority to do anything they please. The industry-chosen and government-sponsored official narrative that vaccines are perfectly safe and effective for all is getting harder to question in public. Censorship is growing across American society regarding the science that conflicts with that narrative. Amazon has removed books and movies that dare to question the narrative. Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram have throttled the conversation, and people searching for information on vaccine safety and risk profiles are now likely to be redirected to a government website promoting this safe and effective narrative. And I want to make this obvious to you. There is only one industry in America that has had liability waived on its products that carry known risks that has gotten censorship put in place to restrict criticism of its liability-free products, that has gotten laws passed to coerce families to submit to vaccination and to accept all the liability if something goes wrong, and that has purchased the press to daily encourage hostility and fear to be directed against those crazy anti-vaxxers, the pejorative term used by the industry to mislabel and marginalize informed parents trying to protect their children. You know, if I'm against neurotoxins in my food, does that mean I'm anti-food? And all of this for what most people will acknowledge as the most corrupt industry on the planet. They're the number one lobbyist in the halls of power, the number one advertiser in our media. They're a top donor to political campaigns at the state, national, and party level. And notably, the four companies that make vaccines mandated for our children are all convicted felons, and they've all paid billions and billions of dollars in penalties, fines, and damages for their criminal behavior on their other products. Now the big tech companies are making deals, like Google with a $668 million partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, and which is now hiding, blocking, and delisting sites with vaccine risk information. How people can believe these corrupt companies have found God on vaccines is proof of the power of censorship combined with relentless pro-pharma propaganda. Vaccines have become a heated topic in our schools, our workplaces, neighborhoods, social groups, and religious centers. And the media establishment refuses to investigate and instead relentlessly promotes the benefits of vaccines while ignoring questions of safety and actively suppressing scientifically valid criticism. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to talk about this. And we're going to. We've got a great lineup of speakers, including Oregon State Senator Dennis Linthicum, Dr. Brian Hooker, and Dr. Jennifer Margulis. And we have Tiffany Trahan to thank for the opportunity. Tiffany is the founder of the Oregon Vaccine Education Seminar. She's a Jill of all trades and master of none, as she puts it. Being a parent with concerns about mandated vaccine products was all the inspiration she needed to organize these events throughout the state of Oregon, because one person can make a difference. It is my great pleasure to introduce our first presenter this evening, Oregon State Senator Dennis Linthicum. <laughs> Dennis is currently serving Oregon's 28th district, which is comprised of all or part of five Oregon counties, Jackson, Klamath, Crook, Deschutes, and Lake. His educational background includes a bachelor's degree in economics from UCLA and a master's from Biola. 
He's also a former Klamath County Commissioner, and prior to his election to public office, he was a Senior Vice President for Software Development with a Fortune 500 company, a licensed Oregon contractor, a rancher, and the blogger known as the Dirt Road Economist. <laughs> He's a powerful advocate for individual liberty and personal responsibility, and I have to say this now that I have you right here, you kind of remind me of Fess Parker. <laughs> I'm turning 70 in a couple of weeks, so that might not be a reference you know, but he was a Disney actor who played a lot of patriotic heroes like Davy Crockett. And when I first saw Dennis speak on the steps of the state capitol, I just thought, Fess Parker! <laughs> So uh, he's going to talk about the 21st century health issue that no one was talking about until now. Please join me in a very warm welcome for Senator Dennis Linthica. Thank you, thank you. You guys are fabulous. And I don't know how uh, Fess Parker's family feels about that. You know? <laughs> what a slap. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm here, you, you heard, I have a degree in economics and I write, uh, I used to write as the Dirt Road Economist. Today I'm, I mostly write a newsletter. If you have not signed up for my newsletter, I suggest you sign up for my newsletter. Um, you can, I've got business cards and you can find me on the OregonLegislature.gov website and there's just a e-newsletter deal, drop your your email address in there and boom, you're on my list and you'll get emails or newsletters as I write them. <clears throat> the reason newsletters are so fundamentally important is quite frankly most legislatures don't write newsletters. They would just assume you didn't know what was going on and even when they do write a newsletter, they write a newsletter about SB 13, SB 48, HB 16, HB 385, and then every once in a while, there's one that you get a handle on, and that's HB 3063, and your eyes pop out of your head. But all of those others, HB 3061, and 3062, and 3065, and 3078, and they're, they're all intrusions on your life and your liberty. And so the reason I'm here today is to talk a little bit about your constitutional rights, your natural rights, and the, the rights that gives you for informed, consensual agreement to medical procedures and vaccines. This is all something that belongs to you as individuals. Uh, in Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables, how many read it? Somebody. Good. More than half. That's great. And your kids are all going to grow up to read it too. <laughs> and he has a statement in there where he says, man is not a circle with a single center, rather he's an ellipse with a dual focus. And his point is, one of those focus, he continues on, one of those focal points is facts and data and science. And the other focal point is our philosophy and understanding and moral conviction and values. And it's, this is part of the game we're going to talk about. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave the data, the science, the efficacy, the charts, and the graphs to these other guys, because they're the panelists who have this phrase PhD after their name. And I'm just a legislature. And as a legislator, I'm going to talk to you about rights that belong to you and should not belong to the government. They just don't belong to the state. They belong to you. Families are, your family is, and families in general are the primary, irreplaceable focus of human flourishing. And the state keeps wanting to step in and say, that's our domain, we know what's right, we're the experts. And in the same way I just confessed, I'm leaving the data to Jennifer and Brian, they're the experts. I'm just a guy who's going to say yay or nay or, you know, get legislative counsel to put together an idea. The ideas are far more important 
than the desire for the legislative body to take control of your children and mandatorily vaccinate them before they'll give them an education. At some point, this is just an explosive topic. And as the, the one individual said, we need to figure out how to marshal an army that can rebel against this notion that somehow magically the state is in charge. They know better. Um, how many of you, uh, how many of you back in time, just you may have to go a few years, uh, drove a Ford Pinto? Anybody here drive a Pinto? <laughs> oh, oh, sweet. The boy. The, now, that's a lot of Pintos for, for a crowd this yeah. side. It's like, wow, I didn't know they penetrated the market that far. <laughs> You know, uh, I, I made fun of Pintos. I'm sorry to offend you guys. So, what do you know about the Pinto, right? It, it had an um, extremely dangerous safety configuration where there was no support around the gas tank and the bumper was an inferior bumper, a low quality bumper. And what happened when one of those Pintos, you guys made it through without our uh, back ender, but what happens when one of those pintos got knocked in the butt? What happened? They exploded and people lost their lives. And what did the market do? There was liability right on the spot, right? This is why we were able to turn the pinto into a relic. It's because liability was there and the the culture at large, the individuals who own them could take an active stance, pursue liability action in the courts, and put public pressure on to change a design that was you know, ill-suited to the world that we live in. I would suggest the reason we're having such trouble changing the design or changing or upending the mandates that we're seeing in front of us is because those products are liability free. And we talk about the 63 doses that are required today and we know about DTaP and MMR and pertussis and all of these things. There are 271 vaccines, new vaccines in the pipeline. Are they going to mandate two weeks from now, two years from now, three years from now, 271 new doses of vaccines into your child when your child is six days old. What will the world hold for us? And so it's a very interesting topic. You also might remember a while back in 2005, not as long ago as you Pinto owners, but the rest of you will still be able to play this memory game. In 2005, the UN claimed that H5N1 avian flu would be an epidemic in the year 2005, and they estimated millions, quote, millions of deaths from that flu. So uh, H5N1, a giant research and development sucking money out of every corporate entity who's involved in making vaccines, all kinds of service industries were involved in that. Everybody went on head on at this issue to try and clean it up because we were so afraid of what the UN had predicted. It turns out that was really a, a ghost. Fewer, get this, fewer than 300 people died from H5N1. Fewer than 300 people died from that tragedy that was on our horizon. It was a ghost. It was not true. It was a ghost. I'll, I'll refrain from calling it an absolute lie, right? <laughs> but, but look at what they did. They sucked resources, scarce and limited resources out of every pocket to pursue that for no reason for not. It didn't matter. It was irrelevant. Do you know that um, in terms of uh, in terms of malaria, 
3,000 people die daily around the world from malaria. This was 300 people from the entire year of H5N1. And so those resources, those, the economic bandwidth that got funneled into this product didn't get used in all those other areas. And from an economic perspective, this is a real tragedy because every time the legislature tries to do something, those are economic resources that can't be used for something else. And so what we see is this constant shuffling and shifting, looking for who, who's going to win the prize today and who will get the goodies. So when, when we think about this, I want to describe your natural rights and why your natural rights are so important. These rights belong to you as individuals, and you guys know this. You've heard it a thousand times. It starts with the Declaration of Independence, and you can, come, you can echo along with me. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for the people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and assume among the powers of the earth the equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. You know all of that, but the real beauty is in the next paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths to be obvious. It should be clear to everybody, in particular individuals in the legal profession, in particular legislators, in particular the California Assembly and the Oregon House and Oregon Senate. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and among these our life first, life, and then liberty to live your life as you please, and then the pursuit of happiness, or as I say, typically, your own just pursuits. They've got to be just. You've got to have that moral compass set, but they're your pursuits, and they belong to you, and they belong to your family, and you have the right to pursue those ends regardless of what the state is going to try and force you to do. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, what's really interesting about this phrase is this is deriving their just powers, their appropriate exercise of power from the consent of the governed. And why is it that we're so enamored with bossing people around? Why is it we're so enamored with coercing people into action? I, the legislature constantly wants you to do X and Y and Z and get a permit for A and B and C. Oh, and by the way, every time they make you do X or Y or Z or get a permit for A, B, or C, they're going to charge you. Isn't that convenient? The legislature raised fees, not taxes, fees by $1.2 billion in this last legislative session. What, Diane said something. What did you say? I was just going to say the supermajority. Oh, yeah. Not a I, single Republican vote. Diane hates it when I say the legislature and I was voting no the entire time. You know, so she wants me to be sure and address it was the supermajority that raised raised your taxes, raised your fees. 1.2 taxes went up by five billion dollars. Fees only went up by 1.2 billion dollars. That includes boating fees, hunting fees, driver's license, recording fees for the sale of real property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everywhere they could, they jacked a fee and they took money out of your wallet to pursue their ends. This isn't how government was designed. This is not what we signed up for. And we know this because the Bill of Rights, the original First Amendments, you know, the initial Ten Amendments, we call them the Bill of Rights, they describe what government can't do. Congress shall make no law abridging, right? 
In other words, it's a no, no, no on Congress. Whack their hands if they ever reach into that direction. This right shall not be infringed, right? Without the consent of the owner, that's number three. Number four, the right of the people to be secure shall not be violated, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, no person shall be held or deprived of life, liberty, or property. These are all nays against what government can do because your freedom is the ultimate. Everything about this consent of the governed is about you as free beings, free individuals, making your own minds and making your own choices. And this is what has made America one of the greatest nations on earth. These rights are individual rights, and as I read earlier then, they're inalienable. They cannot be alienated from you. Nobody can take them away. You just can't take them away. Uh, inalienable, also, we don't really know how they spoke it back then, but you can also pronounce it inalienable. And I don't know if you've heard this before, but inalienable means they can't be leaned. A leanable piece of property can be leaned, like a lien on your home. It's a first right of transfer on your home. It's a lien. It's a leanable property because people can transfer that property by putting liens on it. You have a lien against, you've got a second lien, you've got a first lien, you've got a mortgage, etc. Inalienable means no liens can be placed on this. It can't be leaned. It cannot be taken from you. The inalienable is the same concept. They're a little bit different, but I, I just mentioned that so you can win the next uh, trivia you know, contest that you have in your living room. In today's political realm, politicians can promise health care housing, jobs, transit. But think about this. To give one person health care means you actually have to extract resources from somebody else. And maybe it's from a lot of people, and it's only a little bit that we're going to take from everybody, but we're going to direct those economic resources somewhere. The same thing we see going on with vaccines. We're going to take a little bit out of every vaccine and we're going to force your, the sale of vaccines into pharma's pockets. Well, I say force into pharma's pockets. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? That's what mandatory vaccine requirements do. They force you to vaccinate your child and you get a bill for that vaccination. Oh, maybe not on the spot, but you'll get a bill later. You'll get a bill in your taxes. You'll get a bill for Oregon Health Association. You'll get a, a bill for the Oregon, uh, uh, the, the, the entire ball of wax will have some portion of that that gets given, given to you as a requirement to pay. So vaccination rates, when we think about 93% vaccination rates or 93% vaccination, that has nothing to do with public health. That has to do with vaccine sales. We got 93% of the people to buy vaccines. We got 95% of the people to buy vaccines. Are they healthy? I don't know. And chances are they are. We know SIDS is skyrocketing. We know chronic disease. We know that uh, you, you now have friends and family and young children who are allergic to tree nuts. They've got gluten allergies, they've got dairy allergies, they've got chronic health issues. We now have more diabetics than ever before, and they actually refer to the diabetic population as the first non-disease epidemic to impact America. And it's interesting, it's not caused by a disease, it's not caused by a virus. Well, then where is it coming from? And nobody is willing to ask those questions. Where is it coming from and why is it striking our children and our grandchildren? And what will we do? How will we band together? How will we rise up and how will we put it into this? These rights belong to you and they cannot be taken from you, so don't let them. And that's why we're here tonight, 
This is supposed to be an open conversation, but quite frankly, I am a big, 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 big small government guy. And I'm quite alone in the Oregon legislature. And so I appreciate your help. We have trouble with legislators who mistake emotion for wisdom or impulse for knowledge or good intention for sound judgment. Good intentions don't make sound judgments. To make a sound judgment, you've got to look at the data and our next speakers will give us a shot at data, what it looks like, what are the issues that your children will face, what are the issues that we as a culture will face, and how will we deal with those issues. So I thank you for um, letting me have some time here. We'll do question and answers afterwards. So if, afterwards, so if I said something that you'd like to challenge or ask questions about, hang around and we'll circle back.